Street Life Ministries is a Christ-following nonprofit that serves homeless folks on the Mid Peninsula. We meet really interesting people, and today we'd like to share one of those with you. Hello, everybody. Uh, today I am uh, joined with a good friend of mine, Jacob, and we get to hear Jacob's story today and uh, share with him. I'm super excited to have Jacob with us. Um, I know a little bit about his uh, story, just the tail end of it, and to what we're what we're gonna. Well, what he's doing today, but uh, I've I have not uh, heard your your story of like the journey to get there. So I'm super excited to hear that. Right on, um, come full circle. There we go. Um, but before we get there, if we don't mind, well, let's just go ahead and offer this uh, this time to prayer. Okay, uh, Lord, thank you so much, God, for uh, Jacob and his life. God, thank you so much for the testimony that you have uh, put in his life. And uh, Lord, just thank you so much for saving him and uh, walking alongside of Jacob and uh, rescuing him from his addiction. And now just the mighty things that you're, uh, that you're doing in his life today and, and just the journey that you have for him uh, for the future, God. Thank you so much. And just bless uh, all those who hear this uh, testimony, all those who uh, uh, listen to uh, the podcast. Um, Lord, I pray that this, this message speaks to somebody and uh, they reach out and, and they ask for your help and, and for, your, uh, for your guidance in their life. So we pray these things in your son's name, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Cool. So, Jacob, yes, sir. how are you? I'm good. Thank good. you for having me. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here, man. Yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've been wanting to do it for a little while, so it's it's nice to be able to. That's awesome. So how old are you? I'm, I just turned 28. Just turned 28. Awesome. Yeah. So born and raised? Born and raised, Redwood City. Lived here my entire life until we moved to Georgia about two years ago. Yeah. Lived there for a year and a half and moved back when I was at my worst, but helped me get to my best. There so you go. That's It's cool. all for a reason. So, um, t- walk us through a little bit of your childhood. Uh, well, my dad and my mom split up when I was two. So, my dad kind of just left. He moved to Colorado and did his own thing. And I grew up with my mom and my grandparents for the most part. So, it was a lot of, a lot of uh, not really moving around, but just trying to learn new situations through family and just learn how to be comfortable in all situations. <laughs> yeah. Um, decent childhood? Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, I, it, it wasn't bad. I was, I was always taken care of. I played a lot of sports growing up, so that was always there. I got along great with my grandparents, and they were foster parents when we lived with them for a little while, so it helped open me up to, you know, there's kids that are going through a lot worse and, you know, I saw my mom just completely kick ass for the most part and deal with her own stuff. But knowing that she was making it somehow, some way. Yeah. And that that all came full circle, too. Cool. So, you know, going through school and your journey, like what, when did you when did you start to kind of dabble into partying a little bit? Uh, my junior year of high school. Junior year of high school? Yeah. That, where, did you, where did you go to high school? Uh, I, I started off at a school in San Jose called Downtown College Prep, and it was a first-generation, uh, or it was a college prep school for first-generation Latinos to go to college. So my first day, I kind of stuck out a little bit, <laughs> and most people looked at me and went, why are you here? And long story short, I just didn't have good grades through middle school, <clears throat> excuse me, and so they tried me at that school. My freshman year, I did really well. I was on honor roll. I had a, you know, a good GPA, but I was a chubby white kid, had glasses, got made fun of a lot, didn't really fit in. So my sophomore year, I decided I'm going to start to fit in, and the only thing I could think of was to start getting into fights. Mm-hmm. So I got into fights a couple times and got suspended a couple times, and at that point, I thought, well, if I could tell kids at school that I was getting suspended for fighting... They might think a different way of me. How did that work? Uh, it, fitting in wise, it worked well. Yeah. Grade wise, it didn't. Yeah, the grades. Yeah. So fighting doesn't really help the grades. No, huh? no, not at all. And then uh, you know, I had some had some family stuff going on after sophomore year, so we moved back up to Redwood City, and I started Sequoia my junior and senior year, and junior year was going good. 
Uh, I was on the football team, met some good friends, but had that family stuff going on. And once that started and I didn't really have too many people to say no. So I just kind of said, I'm going to go do my own thing. And that's when I started smoking, started drinking and just thought, well, you know, the cool guys are doing it. So I might as well, too. Right. And I, I, I take it that affected your grades as well. Oh, yeah. 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 Did my, you, you ended up graduating, though? No. No. So what did you do? Uh, halfway through my senior year, <clears throat> I, I was told by a guidance counselor that I was not going to graduate no matter what I did. And so I looked at her and I said, OK, well, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste anyone else's time. So I'm going to leave and I'm just going to go get a job. And that's what I did. And I started working at In-N-Out in Redwood City when it first opened. I worked there about six months after it opened. And I worked there for a little while, and then that went downhill and just kind of moved around jobs. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't able to really listen to anyone or get along with anyone. So I made a lot of choices that I was going to go and be on my own whether it meant sleeping on the street or at a friend's or anything else, I was going to turn away help because I didn't want to follow guidelines. Now, did you deal with any homelessness? Yes. How long? Uh, The first time was about three months. The second time was six months. And the third time was nine months. All all here in Redwood City? Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, I mean, you were actually homeless. You weren't uh, couch surfing. You were actually on the street? Yeah. Yeah, uh, for a while I I was with a group of people that were also homeless, but we all kind of looked out for each other, and uh, we used to sleep in tents under the bridge in front of Toys R Us when it was still there, mm. and did that for a couple months. And what year was this? Uh, twenty twelve, twenty thirteen. Oh, I'm surprised I didn't run into you. I wonder if I did run into you and I just didn't realize it. Yeah, you might have. Because I was doing outreach at that time. Yeah. That's I, interesting. It, it definitely might have happened. I, I used to hang out with that group around uh, the square downtown at Sequoia Station, mostly. And then... Um, That's a real... You know, that actually is a trip. I, I You and I have definitely have crossed each other's paths. I just don't... It just... I don't remember it. Yeah. Well, that, that was when I first started hearing about Street Life. So were you... Really quick... I, I, so were you hanging out with that group of folks that with that when the incident happened downtown where the guy got stabbed for a cigarette? Uh, I knew him. You know him. I knew I knew the guy that got stabbed and died, and I knew the guy that stabbed him. And yeah. actually, the guy that died was a brother of a close friend of my kid's mother. So I know that family too. Yeah, yeah, that was really tragic. So, I know that caused a lot of problems. I, I mm-hmm. one for especially for one gentleman. In particular, who's been, he's he's. I think he's clean and sober right now, but he's really struggled with that because mm-hmm. of the fact that he, he took the whole situation on his own shoulders. Yeah, you know, because he said he should have been there, and I mean, it's just it was a horrible situation. Yeah, I, so. had, I had actually left that exact situation about fifteen minutes before it happened. Wow. I was wow. I was there with a couple other people, and yeah. we could tell things were getting heated and not going well, and something was going to go down pretty quick. And uh, I, all over a cigarette. Yeah, yeah. All over a cigarette. I heard. Yeah. And I, and being a part of that group down there and knowing how everything went when people say that, I it sounds really callous, but I've seen situations like that over cigarettes, hundreds of times. Oh, you know, Absolutely I've seen hundreds. I've seen stuff over shopping carts. That yeah. I mean, literally, people don't realize it. Like, you know, like the way I would almost defend my home. I've seen people defend their shopping carts, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it, yeah, I, I get any, it, and it spirals out of control quick. Very quick. You know? and especially when there's other influences like drugs, alcohol, other people, because, you know, if, if you have someone behind you saying, yeah, do it, do it. Most yeah. of the time it, it'll put that wind in your sails to push you forward. Right. And that's, that's when the, the worst of the worst can happen. Right. And especially not thinking about things, being impulsive. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of my decisions and mistakes were because of impulse. Right. It wasn't thinking about long term. It was thinking about short term. Right now, what do I want? How am I going to get it? 
and not thinking about long-term consequences. Right. Well, that doesn't enter the th- the equation. No. Right. It's just a no. it's a sad, it's a gratif- it's instant gratification and nobody mm-hmm. thinks about like okay, could this land me in jail for a long time? Right. right. And and so even being a part of that situation or not a part of it, but being there when it was starting knowing now that it was basically God picking me up and saying you need to move. Because this could go against you, this could go against people that you're close to, you could be a part of this, you could end up in jail. And it was maybe 15 minutes after I had left that that happened. Right. And I didn't even hear about it until the next day. So. So, um... So you just mentioned God. That I know we're going to get to that part too. I just want to know. So were you were you raised knowing the Lord or, or? Yeah. So when I was when I was a little kid and me and my mom moved in with my grandparents while my mom was dealing with some of her stuff. My grandma used to go to church every Saturday night in Menlo Park Presbyterian. So that was our little. That was our thing to do. Sure. Was you know I was like five six years old and we would go to church Saturday night. I would always sit and watch the organist play and we would stay after so I could watch him play and you know after that we would go to uh, Albertsons when it was still over there now it's Lucky's but we would get a half gallon or a gallon of ice cream and go home and just sit and talk and that was that was our Saturday night that's cool so that's cool so you grew up with fellowship and and you grew Mm -hmm. up with with the word so that that's interesting so okay cool um so then so then going back towards the the the, the downtown square and stuff. So all that incident happened. Um, you're, you're obviously, you're living on the streets at that time. Um, so what, what were you using at that time? Were you, what drugs were you using? Uh, when I was, when I was homeless, it was a mix of everything. Yeah. And I mean everything. It, the only drugs that I haven't done are acid and heroin. Okay. But I was a prescription opiate user for more than five years. So it's basically doing heroin, just not intervening intervenously but right it's still the same effect meth yeah yeah okay did you that that was more of um that was when i was doing coke and it was a mixed up bag so yeah. you know you get the burn and stuff and people say if you feel a burn then you know it's not that and i was just inexperienced so that only happened twice but I never smoked it or anything, nothing like that. I actually saw a lot of people that I was really close with get hooked on meth, and I saw them going down, and I would look at them and say, I'm never going to be you. And that was one of my biggest downfalls, right. was being able to point the finger yeah. just in the wrong direction. That's, that's funny, because I, 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 I laugh at that. It's not, it's not funny, but it is funny, because I used to, I used to say the same thing. Mm-hmm. I'm, uh, you know, when I used to... Well, um, my, one, of, one of my first things I started using was cocaine. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of like the rich man's drug. Yeah. Well, the only reason why I was able to do it was because I was stealing it from my dad. And he, he you know, so I, I would do the rich man's drug, but I was doing it for free mm-hmm. until my dad decided to get clean and sober. And then the rich man's drug went away. And I used to always say, uh, I used to look at people that would crank. Mm-hmm. At the time, at that time, it was biker's dope. And I used to always think that they're the lowest of the lows. That that's 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 cheap drugs. Those are those are those are derelicts. Mm-hmm. Until the cocaine ran out, and I started doing crank. Well, for, and then all of a sudden I was I didn't look at it so much that way anymore. Well, for me and cocaine, it was a lot like trying to fit in in high school. Sure. So it was okay. Everyone in California, or the the status quo is that you know most kids my age smoke weed, so you're just another person in the bunch. Most kids my age drink, so you're just another one in the bunch. I gotta stick out somehow. Right. I gotta I gotta show people that I'm what I say I am, <laughs> even if I'm not anything close to it. So when I first tried cocaine, it you know people were coming up like, "Whoa, dude! You know you're serious? You know, wow!" Right. And it almost gave you notoriety. Sure. And getting notoriety, especially in situations when you're in a spot like that can do a lot for you at the moment or make you feel certain ways. And I did it for about two weeks. And after two weeks, I, I had a very long conversation with myself and said, you really like this and you're getting addicted. It's way too much money and you've almost gotten in fights over it already. So you've got to stop. And I did. 
but I was never able to have that conversation about any other drug. Interesting. And I, it, it might have been the price. It might have been the quick feeling. I don't know what it was. But that one, I was able to turn away and just say, I'm all right. <clears throat> but anything else, it was it was just a go. So, okay, so um, going fast forwarding a little bit. So at, at what age was that about? Uh, that was about 18 to 20. So and now I know you have two kids. Mm-hmm. So walk us, so catch us up to that. So w- w- right around when, did, how old were you when that, when that all happened? Um, I was, I was 22 when my kid's mom got pregnant and we actually met while I was homeless. She was a friend of someone that used to hang out with some of the crowd that I did. And we actually met at the square one day mm-hmm. and I was actually living in a stairwell. There's that parking garage across the street from the fire department downtown, and I used to sleep in the third floor stairwell. Mm. So, meeting her, we instantly clicked. You know, we had known somewhat about each other, but having the mutual friends, it was easier to get to know each other. Sure. And I, I just absolutely fell in love. Mm. And it, it, it wasn't about using her for anything. But it was knowing that someone saw me at my worst and was able to see through that and see that under the skin and under the, all the problems and addiction that I was there. Right. And I was able to start to slowly find myself through that. And so I ended up moving back in with my grandma for a little while after we met. And she, um, I had a buddy come over one night and it was about nine at night he had left got in his car and I saw him drive down the street through the front window about five seconds later I see a car come back and so I'm like okay he forgot something and I look out and it's my kid's mom walking up and she knocks on the door I'm sitting in the living room with my grandma my grandma was maybe five feet from me she knocks on the door and I open it and I'm like hey what's up And she looks at me and goes, I'm pregnant. And I went, whoa, 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 quiet. You know, my grandma's right here. Like, come outside. And so I was asking her about it. And she said, yeah, like, you know how I've been feeling sick lately? Well, my mom took me to the the ER to get me checked. And I'm pregnant. And so it kind of went from there. And I looked at her and I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? And she said, well, I'm keeping it either way. What do you want to do? And I said, if you're going to keep it, then I'm going to stay and I'm going to be a dad no matter what it takes. You know, I love you. I care about you. And I know what it's like to not have a dad around. So I'm not going to do that to you or our son, which I didn't know he was a boy at the time, but right. (laughs) You know, it, it just kind of went from there. And so I, I started working a job at Canyon Inn because I was trying to get my stuff together, but I was still drinking and smoking all the time. I was actually stealing beer from work because no one really knew it. You know, just stupid stuff. Still doing opiates? Uh, No, I, well, on and off, yeah. Okay. I I can't say no. I mean, if they were there or if they were presented, then it was going to happen. Sure, sure. But the day that she went into labor, I was supposed to work. And I called my boss and said, you know, my son's being born. I'm calling in today. So he fired me for calling in the wow. day that my son was born. Wow. So that was that was like a welcome to the real world kind of thing. And it was time to really figure some stuff out. And luckily, her family had some ties through their job. And I was able to start working for Costco about two weeks later. So that helped out a lot. Hmm. But... Um, yeah, you know, it, it definitely wasn't easy. Sure. And even even before that, just to digress a little bit, when I was uh, when I was eighteen, I was living with my grandma also, and I went to bed one night. I was just going through stuff, you know, normal teenager stuff, but I was also using a lot. And I went to bed one night, and I just said, "I'm I'm tired of this feeling. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to be here anymore. And if I wake up feeling this way in the morning." I'm done. And I said it out loud. 
on her couch. And I mm. went to bed and I woke up and I sat up and I said out loud, today is my day, I am done. And I walked in her bathroom and I just grabbed a pill bottle. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was going to do. I mean, they could have been antacids and I was going to take them. Mm -hmm. So I took a handful of five, then I took another handful of five, and then I took ten. And something, knowing now it was probably the Lord trying to intervene somehow, but I called my best friend at the time, and I told him what I did, and I told him what my plan was. And my plan was to commit suicide. Right. And he freaked out, came over to that house, and after I took that full amount of 20, I don't remember anything. Mm -hmm. What I was told happened was I took 75 to 100 out of him, which most of the time would definitely kill someone. Mm -hmm. And I woke up in the ICU about two, three days later, and I only have little memories here and there, but um, one of the biggest ones I have was waking up in the ICU trying to get out of it and my mom trying to calm me down and just remembering some of the things I said to her were just things you should never say to someone. Mm -hmm. And she's told me that she knew that it was because everything was still going through my body and you know so on and so forth. But there was just so much pent up anger and resentment and sure. So that that's when it came out. And I ended up going to the psych ward for a couple of days. And when I, when I was in there on my 5150, that was when it really clicked for me that God has a plan for you. And it was not your time to go. Because if it was, you would have gone. But it wasn't. So now's the time to start figuring that out. And so those years in between were were when I was back to homeless and using and stuff like that. But then having my son, that was my real moment of like, okay, you got to you gotta straighten up. So were you and your baby's mom still kind of in and out of relationship or? No, we were, we were full on relationship. Um, were you living together? Not at the time, but we moved in together. At, <laughs> we moved in together about maybe a month or two after and just tried to see how that was going to go but a lot of it was just learning more about each other learning more about the relationship overall how to be parents and learning how to be parents and do all of that was a lot in itself I mean especially because at the time, I was still using on and off. I, it, that was a lot of opiates during that, right. during that period. And right. still smoking, still drinking. Not as heavily, but it... What was she thinking about all that? Did, was she saying anything to you, or was she just kind of... She, she would always try to slip something in that I needed to do something about it, or I needed to stop. But I was really good at hiding things. So was this, was this around the same time like when I used to come here to because I had my off my office was here, was this around the same time where I always see you kind of just sitting in the van, when when she would bring your your kid to school or, was that after? Uh yeah no it was it was around then around then it, when, it was it was your mom was working in the office and, yeah, yeah okay yeah it was all through that most of the time I didn't even want to show up because I was either high on something or I was on a come down from something early in the morning and was trying to figure out a way that I was going to get my next fix. So what was the, um, so what was the thought process around going to Georgia? Uh, well, I had my best friend moved out there cause he got restationed in the army. And when he moved out there, he gave me a call and was telling me about how cheap it was. It was nice, you know, this and that. And I kind of bought in. And I decided to tell my kid's mom about it, and she was all for it. And at the time that we were talking about that, my daughter had been born, 
and she was about a year old. So my son was three, my daughter was one, and me and their mom were pretty aware that our relationship was on a strong decline. Sure. And it was more of like, let's let's try this to put a Band-Aid on an open wound and see if it works. Right. Knowing that it probably wouldn't. And I had people very close to me and family tell me, you know, if you go, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And I knew most of that was going to be true. I had had those feelings. I had the strong feeling it was going to happen and that stuff would go bad and go wrong somewhere. But I told my mom, I told my family that I was going to try it. And if something bad happened, I would take a note, put it in my pocket and remember it for later. Did it go bad? It went very bad. It went very bad. It went very bad. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so did you, when you got to Georgia, did you um, have a, have an epiphany and stop using or did, did you just find no, other ways to use there? I, I found different ways. It was actually, it was to the point where when we were driving out there, because we drove cross country, we got to the California Arizona border, and I decided that I was gonna find a, a weed dispensary, and there's one on the border of California and Arizona that we were on. So we stopped, got some weed and stuff, you know, ate some edibles, and then kept a joint. And when we got to Georgia, we smoked it. I think like the second day we were there, and then didn't even pursue it. So we didn't smoke anything for about six, seven months, but that's when the alcohol took over because it's, you can find it anywhere. It's not illegal in any state. Sure. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta be able to buy it. Was your, was your kid's mom using too, along with you? Uh, she, she smoked weed, but she never did anything else. No drinking? It, occasionally, but it wasn't, it wasn't anywhere close to what I was. I mean, she might have a beer or two a night. I was on a fifth a night. So how long did you how long did you guys stay in Georgia before you realized okay this is not working I got to come back? I realized that honestly I realized that about the day we got there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on, on on our way out there, our van broke down in Birmingham, Alabama, at five o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and had to get that all fixed and figured out. And that was when it really set in, like, you know, the, there's something telling you that you shouldn't have done this, but right. you didn't listen. And now you're getting the hiccups and the speed bumps along the way. And yeah. so getting the van fixed, we found the only repair shop that could have fixed it, the only guy in town that could have fixed it, and the last part in town, and the guy happened to be from Stockton. So meeting him in the middle of Alabama and having him fix the van with the last part and everything, it was like, okay, you know, maybe we're just meant to have trials and tribulations, but still supposed to do this. No. I mean, that, that first day in Georgia, I was very, very sure that I had made one of the biggest mistakes in my life. Oh, man, yeah, I know how that feels. And it never left. So when I got married, um, I had, we, my ex-wife and I, we had a, a daughter together. And we lived here in Redwood City, and uh, we decided to go back to where she was born and raised, and that was Roanoke, Virginia. Mm. And um, I remember the, the day after we got there, and I started driving around looking for like where I'm going to work and what I'm going to do. And um, just the conversations I was having with the people in the local town, I realized I am, I'm no longer in California for sure. Mm -hmm. And I am definitely not in the right spot. Mm -hmm. It's just the, the mentality, the way, the way the folks there operate and communicate with each other is just something I've, I mean, not bad, not good, just is it California? Right. And, and all of a sudden I realized like I am completely outside of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it was bad. I, I ended up, yeah. obviously, I'm, I came back to California too. But yeah, I totally. Well, and, and so even, even at that, my kid's mom used to tell me all the time that she was really proud of me because I like to be in my comfort zone. I don't like to go do new things. I don't, uh, if I do, I have to have a plan. I have to have times. So I have to know. Now, did she think it was a good choice? Did, I mean, was she enjoying herself? She loved it. Okay. She loved it. And uh, I'm pretty sure she still wants to go back. And we would actually have fights because she would look at me and say, Jacob, 
you're just not happy. Like, you're not happy with me. You're not happy in the situation. You're not happy here. And I would say, you know what? You're right. I'm not. Right. But I moved here for you guys and to try to fix us. And obviously, it's just showing all the holes at the bottom of the boat where all the water is coming through. And now that we're all the way out here, we're kind of stranded on that desert island. And, you know, I'm not I'm not going to leave my kids. I don't want to leave you. But, no, I'm not happy here. Mm. And so that that's when, you know, she we had a long talk and we decided that she was going to try to go back to work. I was going to stay with the kids because we didn't know anyone out there. And I had told her. You know, since since our kids were born that I wanted to be a stay at home dad, I wanted to take care of my kids. I wanted to see them grow up nonstop. I wanted to teach them things. I wanted to spend time and being out there. I realized that I wasn't really doing that. I was I was spending time with them and I was watching them, but I wasn't being the dad that they needed. And, you know, the minute she was home from work, it was all right. You go watch the kids. I'll be in the kitchen putting down some whiskey. Uh, you know, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna make myself sleep tonight. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna make myself be happy in this situation, and that was the only way that I knew how. It was just to go back to the easiest thing to make you numb. Right. So okay. So then, kind of fast forward here a little bit. So then you come back to California. Mm-hmm. All, all four of you mm-hmm. come back to California. Um, I know a little bit about the situation because you ended up, you guys were sp- kind of split up in a, in a way and mm-hmm. you kind of moved in with your mom and then uh, your baby's mom and kids. You guys were, I know you guys were seeing each other, but living in separate spots, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, your mom and you coming to me and saying, hey, you know, I want to find a way to get a hold of my addiction, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, and uh, which was, which was, was awesome. Right. And then, uh, um, yeah, so that, so I remember, I remember when you first got here, I know it was, it was really hard. It was like, like everything, everything that had gone wrong was like just right in your face. Mm -hmm. And I know you were kind of like trying to, you know, eating a big, huge piece of humble pie and at the same time dealing with addiction. And then the, the, um, the rub of living in the home with your mom and your brother and uh, tight quarters and stuff like that was really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so, so now, I mean, now you're clean and sober. Mm-hmm. How much time do you have now? Tomorrow will be 11 weeks. Tomorrow will be 11 weeks. So I'm almost at my three month mark. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So yeah, so kind of walk us through that a little bit. Like, so, um, I know I just kind of did the preamble of like yeah. how, how it was, but, um, well, just to fill in because it does play a big role, but in September of last year, um, me and my kid's mom went through some stuff and I ended up really, really hurt from it. And, uh, that happened in February of last year. So there was a lot of time in between that where I was trying to fix something that was not going to be fixed. And I knew that I knew it personally, Mm -hmm. but I was trying so hard to keep it that way that I couldn't see it. And I ended up, finding a neighbor in our condo building in Georgia that had some pills. And I was like, Hey, you know, I know that those work and I love my opiates. So let me get some. And they weren't opiates. They turned out to be meth. And I knew that they weren't opiates just from being an addict for so long, but I kept taking them anyway. And they were cheap. They were $3 a pill. You know, she goes to work. I do whatever. Great. Cool. And, you know, I, I hit it well. And so I, I ended up almost, I, not almost, I got to be honest. I went into a psychosis at the end of September last year where I thought my kid's mom had an earpiece in and was trying to get me killed. And, I mean, I was full blown. Like, I had called the cops a couple times. I had my cousin or my best friend show up with a gun. And, you know, it was, it was just really bad. And there was one night the cops came twice and the second time they wanted me to get checked because there was something obviously wrong with me. 
and the paramedics showed up and they they talked me into just taking my vitals not going down you know nothing like that my blood pressure was 197 over like 130 it, i mean i was about to have a stroke and they they were well aware of that and so i ended up taking myself to the er with my kid's mom i told them what was going on and they put me into the psych ward without me really knowing mm. so i walked into the room and once i walked into the room they shut the door said here's your clothes you're staying for a while get comfy and they did a blood test and i heard them say over um over a walkie talkie that i was positive for meth and so I looked up and I went, that was about me, huh? And the nurse went, oh, no, 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 it's about someone else. And then she picked it up and said, he's sitting right in front of me. And I just went, oh, man, this is when it's going to just crash down. The doctor came back in. I thought they were going to talk about the meth. What they told me was that I was anemic and that my hemoglobin was so low that I needed an emergency blood transfusion. Hmm. So my... Your hemoglobin's never supposed to be under a 13. Mine was at a 6. Wow. And if I hadn't checked myself in, I probably would have died. So I had three emergency blood transfusions in two days. I was locked in there for three days. Couldn't see anyone. You know, it's in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So, you know, especially in the psych ward, you're not getting visitors. But it's, at that time, it was hard to even make calls. And that was when I really knew that that relationship was over because they had told my kid's mom about what was in me and everything else. And I knew from that point it was done. Right. And so things went on. We ended up moving back. But I know that if I hadn't have gone that night, I would have been dead by now. And I know that. Right. I mean, that that was as clear as day. But that was my rock bottom. And then getting back here and moving in with my mom and having to follow guidelines was something I was not used to again. Sure. I made my own rules. I followed my own path. And my mom was trying to be very accommodating and trying to help me as much as she could. And I saw it a different way. I saw it as you're trying to make me do things instead of trying to help me so we just butted heads and i even when we got back i was telling people i was clean and i was good you know whatever i was out drinking every day i was smoking every day and it got to the point where i i got so drunk one night i went back to my mom's and i all i can remember from it honestly was sitting on my bed and my mom and my brother laughing at me and just going, you are so drunk right now. I like I can't believe it. And that's all that I remember of that conversation. Right. I don't even remember what I drank. I don't remember anything. And then it got to a point where she had to be the mom that I needed and said, you know, you have until this point to get your stuff together or get out. And so instead of doing something about it, I wanted to feel sorry for myself. Mm. which I'm good at also. So I would go and get beers. I go sit at the park and I just sit and drink by myself, have a good old time. Right. right. And of course it wasn't a good time, but that was when it was like, you're not, you're not going to get anything back out of this. Right. You're going to keep putting distance in between you and your kids, their mom, your mom, you know, the, I, I lost a lot of time through the years because I've, I've been using for the past 10 years. So what was the next, so I know you hit your bottom in Georgia. Mm -hmm. You come here and you're obviously, you're at, you're at your bottom, but you need to hit another obviously bottom, right? So what was, so what was that turning point for you when you sitting in the, sitting in the park, drinking beers by yourself, mm -hmm. realizing that this isn't working? Like when, when did the, the light bulb click and you go okay I, i'm gonna do something it it had it had been there and it was more of being scared of having to go down that path and know like you gotta you gotta do this on your own right you know i even had my kid's mom tell me when i decided to get sober 
I, I was asking her to reassure me that she would be there. And she said, Jacob, I'm always here for you, but you have to do this on your own. Right. And I wanted to be angry. I wanted to be upset and say, you know, you're a liar. You were never there, this and that. You did this. But in all reality, I did it to myself. And that was what I had to learn. And so not being able to see my kids and stuff like that, it, it that was like, okay, I have nowhere to go. I have every everything I said I never wanted to be. I'm it right now. Everything. Was that was that around the same time we started talking? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like you, you saw. I've I was arguing with my mom over cigarette money. You know, I mean, we talked about that situation where stuff can happen over a cigarette. You saw how angry I was just over that, and that was at a point where I where I was saying, if I can, if I can just get a pack of smokes for the day, then I won't worry about it or stress about it. And I can move on to the next thing when it was really just wanting to have something there, you know, and not even really trying to work for it or anything. It was just, you know, I'm here. You need to help. Well, what I saw in that situation was somebody who was uncomfortable in their own skin. Mm-hmm. And you were like just... <laughs> you. It was like you were trying to break out of your own skin, but you didn't, you didn't even know what you were going to do. You know, I just... It was... It was, it was a, I know, it was hard. It was, it was a very hard situation. So then you um, get yourself... You, I know you called um, El Central. Got mm-hmm. yourself... Got yourself hooked up with them and started going through the process and uh, started working a program. I, I did, and, and my my biggest thing with that was I was so, so good at hiding my addiction that I was telling them that I was clean and I was using every day. And that's when it was like, okay, you're you're beating the system now too. What else do you need to prove, Jacob? You know, what else? Right. Why don't you just do what you're saying? Why don't you prove to yourself that you can be sober instead of hide using? How about that? Sure. How about how about you show people that? And it it really came down to finding OBH through you. Mm-hmm. And you know, my like I said my mom gave me that time frame and said you have until this time to get your stuff together. And I had I had worked at Target for a little bit and you know, I was lying about s- schedules and shifts and stuff getting moved around I just didn't want to go to work and my mom knew that we just never really brought it up to each other right but she knew I wasn't just following through it was just being lazy and so I got a different job and started working that one where I was actually more comfortable and I was happy with it but you know I knew that that time frame was still coming to an end and that was right around Christmas I mean, I moved into OBH on December 27th, or uh, the 22nd. So that was, you know, my time frame was coming down to the very end, and I was praying a lot about it, and just, you know, I don't want to go back to the streets. Right. I don't want to be there again. And that was when I walked into my mom's house one day, and she said, hey, Dave texted me. He knows of a room that you might be able to rent. But you got to follow all the rules for real. And at that point, I was ready. I, I mean, I'm, I'm ready. I, I, I'm done. Uh-huh. That's cool. And that's, 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 that's cool. And, and, I, and I still have our conversation. I look at it sometimes. Mm. You know, if there's times where I'm getting home at 11 at night and there's no one around and I got some money in my pocket and I'm walking by 7-Eleven or Safeway, it's like, oh, man, a, a beer would be so nice right now. I'll look at that conversation and you saying, you have to be sober. You have to stay straight. And I'll put my phone back in my pocket and just go, you know what? I'm two blocks from the house. That's cool. And once I get to the house, it's done. Right on. Well, that's cool. I'm glad that, that I'm, wow, that's really cool. So what what is, what has been the focus point since you've been at um, OBH and what's, what's changed? Like what's, What's the, the, the biggest driving force for you um, in our brother's home 
and uh, and now doing the thing, you know, obviously being clean and sober and doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. It's mostly been my kids wanting that relationship back with their mom and um, just overall finally knowing or believing I know my purpose through God. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I... My grandma told me since I was a little kid, she would say, Jacob, the Lord is going to use you for great things in life. You just have to believe it. And for a long time, I never did. And I, I would think, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not a millionaire yet. I don't have a big house. I don't have a nice car. You know, what plan? And it's taken me so long. But once I got to OBH, I realized that my plan is to be a walking testimony of broken people through Christ. Right, right. And showing that when you fully do give yourself, when you say, Lord, I'm yours, I'm done. <laughs> I mean, pick me up, do something with me. I got nothing left. See what he does. Because amazing things happen. So is your relationship with Jesus Christ, is it growing? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So you like... So I know that OBH is, is a Christian home. Mm-hmm. So has it has it helped you in that yeah. regards? Yeah, it, it, it's it's kept me on that track because it's it's really easy to go to God and pray when you're when you're wanting something mm-hmm. or when you're low, and then when you get something or when you get to a high, then you say, "All right, yeah, no, I did it myself," and you turn, and it it's learning that when you are blessed and when you get up to that mountain peak to say, thank you for helping me get here, Lord, what's next? That's awesome. And what, what else can I do? My daily prayer is, you know, Lord, please give me the strength, courage, and the tools to fulfill your plan for me. And it used to be, Lord, please let me get 10 or 20 bucks so that I can go get high today. And as sad as that is to say, it is the truth. So do you real do you feel like, um, I'm sure you do, but do you feel like uh, your relationship with uh, your kids has improved? Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's been rocky, and it's I'm sure it's hard for them because they're still so young. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're five and three. so Which is actually a good thing in some ways. Yeah. Because right? a lot of the stuff that they had to go through mm-hmm. when they're really young, they're, they're resilient, and they'll, get, they'll, they'll grow out of that. They'll... they'll forget that that even happened yeah because you're now you're clean and sober doing the next right thing right what about your relationship with their mom are you guys friends um i don't know if i would call us friends yet Mm -hmm. i i i give her a lot of credit and a lot of respect for trusting me enough to be around my kids to answer texts sometimes or you know, the other day she brought my son down and we had lunch together, you know, and it's, I have to be grateful and thankful for the opportunities that I have and not upset about time because it's going to take time. I mean, we were together for seven years and she met me at my absolute worst and pretty much left me at my la- absolute worst. But now she, gets to see, now she gets to see God's greatness. That's right. And. It, now it's it's up to me it's it's there's no finger pointing anymore it's just pointed at yourself has she has she come to a place yet where she's either said something to you and, and or made any kind of gesture where she she knows she sees the change um she she said a couple times that she's proud of me or that you know she she sees that I'm working hard there's a lot in me that doesn't believe it just because of she Almost. probably just wants to see some time. Right. And that's that's the biggest thing was, you know, even when I first got clean, it was like a week. And I would text her and be like, hey, I'm a week clean. You know, you ready to get back together? Right. Like, it, you know, it's not going to happen. Sure. And so now I go, you know, days in between talking with her or, you know, I'll, I'll text her randomly and say, hey, you know, when are you available so that I can see the kids? You know, yeah. it's it, it, my priority needs to be being a father and not worrying about trying to get that relationship back, but be a dad first, work on my program first and give it to God and things will work itself out somehow, some way. Sure. 
Yeah, I remember when I when I first got sober. I had family that wouldn't even speak to me for until I had at least twelve months clean, mm-hmm. and then I had some family that would even allow me to come into their house until I had at least two years clean. And um, and I remember I remember like kind of like, oh, that hurts. Like, why would they why would they do that to me? But then after working my program, I realized, you know, I robbed them. I lied to them. I mean, I did a lot of damage to to earn mm-hmm. their distrust, and um, but it's amazing. Like you know, you said you have uh, eleven weeks, and right, mm-hmm. and um, and and after my doing two years, the two years went by so fast. Yeah, you know, and now yeah. I've got fifteen. It's just it just seems like wow, it goes it just goes by so quickly. Like yeah, and, you know. and well, and it, it, it's funny that you brought up the time because I I was thinking about this this morning and I wanted to make sure that I said it during this was that. There's a lot of times in in the beginning of recoveries where people say, go a day at a time. Go, you know, just go one day at a time. I can't go one day at a time because I get too far ahead of myself, even in one day perspective. Sure. So if I can tell myself, go one second at a time. Sure. Get to this second, get to that second. Keep moving your feet. Don't worry about it. And go from there. And that's been the biggest help. And not, you know, if, if there's going to be something that happens tomorrow, like I was worried about doing this this morning and I I had to kept, 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 keep catching myself and just say, Hey, you know, just go do it. Why are you stressing? You're just talking to Dave. You know, you're going to go see your son for a little bit. You're going to see your mom. Just go get it done. And there was parts of me that, you know, even even with this morning, I had something come up, and it was like, oh well, you might have an excuse to get out of it now, but it's n- no, go do it. You so know? I guess so I guess I didn't answer your text the way you were hoping I would. On you said, hey, I'm not gonna be able to make it. No, oh, I could do it later. <laughs> no, and honestly, that was awesome that that you gave me that answer, because otherwise it would have been an easy out. Sure. sure. And that's that's a comforter comfort thing too is. You know, I, I've i never fully opened up about this story to too many people. Mm. So being able to and reminding myself, this might help someone else. And if this can help even one person know that you can go through hell and back, be on the streets, lose everything. But if you give it to God and if you try hard and believe in yourself, then you can make it. But don't do it for other people because it won't work. If you try to get sober and stay sober for other people, you will lose and fail every time. Do it for yourself to be the better person and to show yourself that. Another prayer that I do daily is, Lord, please let me be a better person tomorrow than I was today. And I can't do that if I'm high, drunk, not setting a good example, anything else. You know, that's I was uh, looking for a way to bring the podcast to an end. That was perfect. Um, I do want to share uh, a couple things w- uh, with th- those who will, who will see this on a video. Mm-hmm. So I-, I noticed when you came in here, I even asked you about them, but I wanted to share that with the people. So I noticed that you got a couple new tats. Yeah. And uh, so what's on your wrists? Uh, I have Caden Thomas and his birthday. That's my son, and Kaylee Jean and her birthday, and my daughter. That's awesome. And I put them on my wrist so that if there's days where I just, you know, I wake up and it's like, well, I don't want to go to work today. Well, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I'm tired. I look down at my hands and I see my kids and I got to keep going. Right. Because it's not just for me. It's for them, too. And then what about on your neck? That's Philippians 4.13. And that's I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I had a lot of people. I, I didn't tell anyone I was getting it or putting it on my neck. Mm-hmm. And I did it because I knew I would have people going, you're nuts. Don't do it. You know, it's a neck tattoo. You might not get a job. You might not get this, might not get that. It's been the best conversation starter that I've probably ever had. It's a great evangelizing piece. Mm-hmm. And it's also so that when I look at myself in the mirror and I have those daily talks, you know, you're, you're making it. You're making progress. Keep going. I can look down and see the 413 and just know, you know, I'm... I'm blessed. Right. I'm blessed. And use the blessings to, to my advantage. That that was another thing I learned through OBH and through church was make your mess become your message and let your test be your testimony. Nice. And I'd rather start passing them now and 
figuring out that mess to help other people. I like that. So it's, cool. it's, it's going to be a fun road. <laughs> it is. Jacob, thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate uh, you sharing your testimony with us. I, I really enjoy watching your journey. Thank you. Um, especially since, you know, you're pretty close to me in my life. You know, mm -hmm. your mom and you are, are really close. So I get to watch your journey. And um, I will say uh, one of the joys I've, I've had is that you, since you work downtown Redwood City, is when I go downtown Redwood City and I see you work. And, and, um, and I've just watched, I've seen you. In a, from your very depressed state mm -hmm. to your angry, like wrestling with yourself state to, okay, I'm gonna do this kind of fake, like you said, I'm gonna fake it till I make it. Mm -hmm. To now, I get to see you, uh, just full of life. Like, can I, I can I add one more? Sure, thing? absolutely. So it, going to that, I keep street life uh, cards in my backpack because mm. I always have my backpack with me. Sure. So usually when I get off work late, you know, there's people around Sequoia Station, whether they're homeless, drug addicts, whatever. Right. I don't judge. I don't assume. But if someone's asking for food or whatever, normally I'll make extra food when I leave work and I'll go and hand it out mm -hmm. and I'll give them a street life card with it. Oh, cool. And say, you know, it, you can get meals here. No one asks any questions. You know, it's not there's no there's no, no trap. You know, it's just a way to help. Sure. But I actually. um I was downtown one night and I put a bag of fries out on one of the, one of the benches at the train station, because I wasn't, you know, I just leave stuff there sometimes because people look. So this guy rode his bike up and I went, hey, are you hungry? Because I saw him looking through a trash can. I said, are you hungry? And he said, yeah, I am. I said, I put a bag of warm fries over there. You know, I didn't mess with him. I work at Five Guys. You know, it's cool, whatever. And so I started talking to him about his story. And I handed him a street life card, told him about OBH and, you know, some of my story. And I put that story on Facebook, on my personal page. And about three days later, I had a random message come into my inbox one night from someone that I don't know. I'm not friends with. And she messaged me and said, that was my cousin. And I've been trying to find out about him and how he's doing for years. And now I'm able to actually know. And she said, I've been crying all night since I read it. Thank you so much for helping him, for blessing him, and for sharing that story so that I have some closure. And for me, that was all I needed to know. Just keep doing it. That's awesome. Story. Keep helping, keep moving. Yeah, that's Be awesome. You know, because there were a lot of times when I was homeless. I, I told one of my roommates this last night. There were a lot of times when I was homeless that I wish someone had stopped and said, what's your name? Are you hungry? Are you cold? How old are you? Most people didn't even know I was that young because I looked older. Right. So most people didn't even know I was 19, 20, 21. So I know that being in that situation, sometimes it's really hard to ask for the help. Or you sure. don't want to ask for the help. You, you, you're scared to. So if I'm able to go down and say, here, you don't have to ask me for anything. Let me help you. Come here. You know, get in touch with this person. If you see me down here, you know, I'm here a couple nights a week, this late, I'll bring some food by. You know, come by at this time, I'll leave it on the bench, whatever. You don't even have to talk to me. But it's a warm meal. And if I can keep helping that way, then I'm fulfilling what I believe is my purpose through the Lord. And that's just giving blessings because I've been blessed through everything I've gone through. And being at where I'm at now, being almost three months sober and having a story that can relate to a lot of people that might not necessarily want to come out of the woodwork. If they're able to hear my story and think, he's, he's doing it. He's been down there. And now he's making the comeback you know, maybe, maybe I could give it a shot and maybe I could get somewhere because we all have it in us. And it's just, it's having to finally commit yourself and only you can do it. No one can do it for you. I mean, even, even when I first moved back, I used to ask you all the time, say, you know, on there, when there's days where you just want to use or when you want to do something, how do you block it out of your head? How do you, how do you get away from that? You know, we would have those conversations. 
and being able to even look at you and know, you know, you're 15 years, mm-hmm. I'm on my way to that. Yep. But it has to start somewhere. Right. And I was always scared to start that road. Yeah. But being on it now, being with my brothers who I can relate to, I mean, my brothers in that house are the best people I've ever met in my life. That's awesome. And people can say, you know, you're in a sober living, you guys are all addicts, this and that. Yes, we are. Yeah. We're broken people, but we accept that. And we try to build each other back up and build each other better because of it. And especially through church. Yeah. I know uh I know four of the guys that you live with really well. Mm-hmm. And I, I will say you got you you're very fortunate with the guys that you live with. They're, yeah. they're, they're solid dudes. Yep. You know, um, I know some of them very personally, and I know some of them just through recovery. But I know four of the guys pretty well that you live with. And yeah, it's, and a, it's an amazing house, and, and and yeah, it's it's definitely anointed. I know God mm-hmm. lives in that house, and I know that uh, I know that Christ is definitely navigating recovery through there. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's, I was it's a actually good house. Um, I uh, we had a house meeting a couple weeks ago, and someone was telling Tom about something in the bathroom or you know a creak in the floor or whatever, and. So Tom was talking about how this is wrong with the house and that's wrong with the house. And I just kind of popped up and I said, hey, this house is a lot like us, huh? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's broken, but the spirit's in it. And everyone just kind of turned around and looked at me and Tom went, that's probably the best way I've never heard this house get put. And I said, well, it's that's true. Good. The house is broken, we're broken, but the Lord is inside it and inside us. Amen. So it's a blessing. Cool. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. God bless. God bless.